My name is Demetrius Schultz. Today I will be interviewing Benny Lee for our Black History Month campaign. Our past shapes our future. Okay, my name is Benneth Lee, but people know me as Benny Lee. Uh, my name is Benny Lee. I was born in the name Benneth. In 1862, Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation of Proclamation. It passed Congress in 1865, giving birth to the 13th Amendment of the United States Constitution, where it declared that, in essence, no person of U.S. citizenship should be subject to slavery or indentured servitude unless otherwise convicted of a crime. You're listening to Chicago Stories, a podcast from City Hall featuring the stories of everyday Chicagoans, as told to Mayor Rahm Emanuel. This is Mayor Rahm Emanuel on Chicago Stories. We are joined today by Benny Lee, who runs and is the CEO of the National Alliance for the Empowerment of the Formerly Incarcerated, as a former uh, gang member of the Vice Lords. Yeah. Do I have that right? Yeah. Okay. I am here through the grace of a merciful God and a praying mother and a father I knew in my heart that didn't give up on me. Uh, they call me Benny for short. Uh, my mother created that name, Benna. My father's name is Benjamin. They called him Benny. They wanted to name me after him, but my father hated the name because his name was Benjamin Franklin Lee, and he didn't like that name, so they called him Benny. And so they end up, my mother say, since they called Kenneth, Kenny, Named me Benneth and called me Benny, so that's how I got the name Benny, and that's what sticks with me. Well, I was born in Ohio, Painesville, Ohio, a little town 20 miles right outside of uh, Cleveland, Ohio, and I stayed there till I was five. And my father left us there to come to Chicago to get a job and apartment to move. It seemed like a lifetime, but it was only for a few months. That's my father. He used to, that's my father. I seen him rings in the back. He's a box. He was a pro fighter. Hmm. And uh, when we came to Chicago, we was in the K Town area. We lived right at Kildare and Van Buren, but we initially went to Heffron School. When I got to Chicago, that's when I first started hearing uh, names like Martin Luther King and Malcolm X, because Malcolm X was still alive in 1963, 64 when he got assassinated in 1965. And, you know, the music even coincided with the, the movement. So we had some kind of consciousness, you know, there was a lot of racial tension going on. And as a result, we band together, us blacks band together. And later we became a street gang because of us coming together to defend ourselves. And it was in 68 when we graduated out the eighth grade and went to Austin High School. We had to travel through this white community to get to school, and we had racial tension in the school. And uh, as a result, I ended up uh, sentenced to the Illinois State Training School for Boys because I was defending myself against white attackers. And initially, all the blacks got suspended, nothing happened to the whites, and they said I was the ringleader. And I'm the only one ended up in juvenile court, and that's when they sent me to IYC, Illinois Youth Commission, uh, Lord Joliet, then eventually in St. Charles. So that's as far as I went to school at the time. Get through this. Get to college. Complete it. Right? And see, right now as you sitting here, believe it or not, you writing your obituary right now. If you die right now, the only thing they can put in your obituary is what you did accomplish in life thus far. When you die, it's over. They can't add nothing else to it. You write in your obituary right now, so think about how you want your obituary to read. That make some sense? What is NAFI, and what's the mission? NAFI, N-A-E-F-I, that's an acronym for National Alliance for the Empowerment of the Former Incarcerated. Uh, we initially came together with the idea of building a voting block among formerly incarcerated and convicted people in Illinois. That's when I was the founder of uh, 
African American Survivors Organization, where we uh, it's pretty much a NAFI is pretty much a spinoff of that, and uh, we got recognition in this book. They did a study of alcohol problems in the United States, a 20-year uh, treatment perspective, and they recognized us back then, African American survivors as uh, one of the uh, most culture-specific organizations to address the issues where they show African-American survivors founded by myself, Ben Fleet, and it talks about our uh, uh, perspective of how do we address issues among ourselves, because, you know, when you sit around other ethnic groups, you might be a little shy to really talk about how you've been impacted by racism or discrimination. So we initially came together to become this voting block to register every former incarcerated and convicted person and their family to become registered voters, to be a strong constituent base to challenge legislators to change some of these policies. And then someone had an idea that we become a non-for-profit organization and we all agreed to it to create something so when people come out of jail and prison, they have somewhere to come and the support they need to deal with, to break through some of the barriers that they face. And so that's how NAFI came about. And now we have a pre-release program where we go in the prison and raise awareness to those that's coming home. You know, kind of the concept of either gonna serve time or make time serve you. And we base it on an African proverb, you can't build your shield on the battlefield. So they have to look at the day they walk out of prison that's when they will have to really do some serious work because the stimulants that cause a person to go to prison are not present in prison. Because no one's telling you to pay rent with the cell you sleep in or pay for the food you eat in the cafeteria. But the day you walk out of prison, you got to figure out how you're going to clothe yourself, feed yourself, house yourself, and to get around. And a lot of people, because they have a criminal background and be denied employment opportunity, and a lot of them don't have work history, that's a struggle and they go back to what they know, like me, I know I can get some money hustling. That's without a doubt, I know I can do that. But that'll lead to prison. So we show them how to make a transition and how to market themselves as a convicted felon, because that's not going anywhere. So that's pretty much what NAFI does. You know, I became a certified drug abuse counselor. Then I got an associate degree in mental health and substance abuse. Then I got a bachelor's degree in inner city studies. Then I got a master's degree in leadership development and education. So today now I'm a professor at Northeast Illinois University while I teach in the Justice Studies program, right? And I'm also the founder of my own non-for-profit organization where I work with young men that's coming out of prison, coming out of jail, and trying to get their lives together. I'm giving back to them. I love getting in front of you young brothers, man. So you ain't got to go down that road. I done been there. One thing about living a life in the world, hustling, you, you, you're not conscious of a lot of things. When I was hustling, I didn't have no need to vote. Why? I didn't have no need for identification because I'm a hustler. If I get stopped by the police, I'm going to give an alias name. I don't need my ID on me. I didn't realize Mayor Daly had died, you know, the, the mayor. And he had been dead 10 years, you know, because that was not important to me, the life I was living. So when it comes to uh, trying to make a transformation, I had to connect myself with people that had some social maturity. And this is the people you're talking about that have social maturity, that have been through school, work jobs, accomplish some things, and kind of be there for your brother or for your sister to show them the way out. This is how you do this. Kind of coach them, you know. But don't frown on them, you know. So that's and make yourself available. Make yourself available. And trust me, it'll come a time when people start realizing that the life they live and they constantly putting themselves in harm's way, and they want to come out of that lifestyle. And they need someone that's living outside that box they've been living in to kind of show them way. So that's what I would suggest to those. Keep your head up. Keep pushing with your goals, and so you can put yourself in a position where you can help your brother and help your sister. Yeah. And then, uh, 
this is something that I got from the, uh, the director of the uh, FBI, <laughs> the Department of Justice Award for Public Service. I've gotten one of these three years in a row. And then I worked on the Police Accountability Task Force. This is typical appreciation. Uh, Mayor Simmons there, Laura Lightfoot, before she became the mayor, she worked on that also. Yeah. So, what does Soul City mean to you? you know, uh, Jane Brown, the one coined that term, Soul. You know, you remember they gave him the term soul brother number one, <laughs> right? You got soul, he had a couple of songs, you the soul, you know, talked about the soul of black people. He, he coined that term, so when you talk about soul, soul city, you can make a reference to the soul of black people. And that's our culture, who we are, what we're about, what we do, our food, our dance, our music, you know. So soul city will reflect that through the nightclubs, the comedy shows, you know, the restaurants, the businesses. That's what Soul City would reflect. So that's what comes to my mind when I think about Soul City. Because you can walk in there and say, these are black people. This is black home. Controlled by blacks. So I was doing research and found that your uh, found out that your mom has a street name out there. How did that come about? Yeah, we standing right here now. That's my mother right there, Miss Ruby Lee. Uh, when she passed, uh, the community came together and said they wanted to honor her and they figured the best way is to name this street after her, just the block she lived on. So I got the article, the a Voice Community newspaper, where they had these streets blocked off. Everybody came out to say what they say. And what really was touching me, what stuck out is when them young brothers, these so-called gang members around here, the comments they made about my mother, they all called her grandma, mm -hmm. you know? And one guy say that still the day when he come down this block, he automatically turned his music down because he pictured my mother coming out telling him to cut that music down. And, and the other ones agreed, I do the same thing, you know? So she still live, right, in some of the things they do. What knowledge would you say on a younger business and which your present self has learned? Has learned? Uh, the older me and what I learned and what I say, if I had my younger person sitting here and I wanted to talk to them, mm -hmm. that's what you say? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would uh, try to uh, give him a picture of what life would look like in the future if he went down, if he came to the fork in the road, which we all do. If he went down the path I took, what that life looked like, versus not going down this road, life would have been different. Mm -hmm. You know, so I would educate him on how to uh, have a relationship with self. You know, how do you uh, be strong enough to stand on principles and valuables, but be conscious of those things that make you feel good and proud of yourself. And think about the time or the moments come when you do something and when it's over with, you ain't gonna like what you did. You ain't gonna feel good about, hey, now how you doing? You ain't gonna feel good about that decision. So make the best decision, because when it's all over with, right, you either gonna like what you did about you, you or you're not gonna like. So go with the thing that builds your esteem and your image up. I teach my grandson that, you know, we play chess. He say, if I move this piece, you can take with this, but then I can take that with this. Then you come back and take it. So that ain't a bad, a good choice. And I tell you, that's the way of life. When you say something to somebody, think about how they might respond, and then how that might force you to respond, and then how they may respond back to you. So think about what you say before you say it. So that's the advice I give a young me, is think about the decisions you make and what that would look like after you made that decision before you make it.
have to wait for a place in the city where black people can go and do business with black people.